the questions link or you can send me an email. Uh, either one is fine, uh, so I can get you that credit. A couple of announcements this morning. Um, ICAT Day is coming up April 29th. The deadline for uh, project for ICAT Day has been extended to today. So if you have not yet put in your ICAT Day project, you still have one more chance. Do it today. Um, sometimes there's a dog, and I, I'd like to mention that there's a dog and it's supposed to be here, but I don't see her this morning. Anyway, if a, if a dog should wander through, that's perfectly normal. Um, her name's Winnie. She lives here. Uh, <laughs> with that, this morning's play date I'm very excited about. We're, we're studying, um, well, we are, you all, are studying um, access, equity, and community engagement in role-playing games. Um, and I, I love that we are, we are working through um, all of these questions together. And I'm not going to say anything else about it because I know you all know what's happening here. So I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth McLean and her team. Take it away. Sounds good. Thank you. Mic level okay? This room's so echoey, I always want to check. Yeah, um, I'm Elizabeth McLean. This is uh, Chris Campo-Bowen. And we've got Alice Rogers over here manning our lovely table. Um, we are the Virginia Tech researcher part of Open the Gates Gaming. Just so you know, um, Alice was talking some folks through tools, but you can get your hands on and even there's certain things you can take home and, and look at that, that we've created in addition to a flyer for an event we're doing later this afternoon. So just in case you have to leave early, if you want to actually come play Dungeons and Dragons with us, the Accessible Technologies Hap Office in 2020 Torg, tor yep, 2020 Torg, uh, will be hosting. And um, you're also welcome to come and just like watch if you're nervous about it. Uh, we're, you know, pretty open and welcoming crew. So yeah, with that, let's uh, look at this agenda. The first thing I wanna talk to you all about is the problem. Um, then we're gonna get into how our solution has been designing access with the community. We'll talk a little bit about how storytelling can serve as both research and advocacy before introducing you to our project proper, um, Open the Gates Gaming with our values and our mission. Hopefully we'll have enough time, if we stay on track, <laughs> to get to some future directions. And we'd love to make sure there's space for questions and conversation with all of you. So this is, this is gonna be the darkest part of the presentation as a heads up. Um, I'm disabled, you might have noticed from my like fancy red rollator. Um, I'm also autistic and I was paying a lot of attention to what was happening during the pandemic. For some of us it was interesting because we had the most accessible work situation we'd had in our entire lives when all of a sudden all of us could work from home and get accommodations. Um, but overall the disability community was really struggling. There was a study that came out in 2021 that was looking at data from um, conversations and interviews with folks with disabilities in the United States between October and December 2020. So these are like the last months of that first year of the pandemic. And this was deeply concerning. Um, they found, and, and keep in mind, when you're doing studies like this, they're not actually diagnosing people, right? So this is based on the studies, based on the questions they were asking, uh, that up to 61% uh, of the disabled adults they were communicating with had a probable diagnosis of major depressive disorder. And 50% of them were meeting criteria for a probable diagnosis of generalized anxiety disorder. These are very, very big numbers. Um, we were really struggling. And the risk factors when they're looking at what makes someone more likely to be encountering this level of depression and anxiety, were social isolation, especially the degree to which your disability was mandating social isolation, um, disability stigma, which was on the rise, unfortunately, but also if you were younger. Younger people were having significantly more problems than older folks. Not a pattern that we often see and one that was deeply upsetting. So, one potential solution, um, sort of presented itself. <laughs> During the pandemic, I had been coordinating online gaming events between the Disability Alliance and Caucus here at Virginia Tech, but also disability culture at the University of Michigan. And we got involved with local community members. We even had folks joining us from other countries. And this was mostly Jackbox games, 
other things like that. But pretty quickly, folks started asking, can we play Dungeons and Dragons? Because Stranger Things went in their whole Dungeons and Dragons direction. Uh, there were some online tools like D&D Beyond, and the popularity of the game exploded. And what's also great about it is that you can play in person. You can do hybrid things where just one person zooms in. You can play it entirely online. So it was ideal for pandemic community building. It's also a game where you are telling a story together. There's not really winners and losers. You can try on different identities. You learn a great deal of empathy. And the types of friendships that you form here, I mean, I feel like the closest analog, it's not even sports teams. I feel like when I was in jazz combos, like it's a little <laughs> bit more like that because you're improvising together and you get all these inside jokes. I mean, the most personal way I can mention is I, I never talked to Chris until we were playing Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and now I don't leave him alone. <laughs> so, sorry, Chris. But yeah, when, when it came to designing access, we were lucky to get the support of the Virginia Tech University Libraries through their collaborative research grants in 2022. So Alice and I started working together on this um, in addition to uh, Kayla McNabb. And Chris, you were a, like, Collaborator. Technically, yeah. Yeah, you were low, <laughs> lower level. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but we started by developing three different tools that would help folks play Dungeons and Dragons. This is not trying to create a separate game. We are not creating a kitty table or a table for disabled and neurodivergent people. These are tools that you can use at a table where everybody's playing the same rules. Um, and we started with our decision guide, our um, character selector and the spell cards. We'll show you a bit more about this later. But one of the big things that we value about this is it's community-driven research. It's not just designing for the disability community. This is something the disability community wanted, asked for, and then they've been driving the design process, both from a number of us identifying as part of the community, uh, but also through our series of like play testing and just the, the general ethos of how we are doing this. So, um, so I want to get into a little bit about how this project has now expanded in some other directions, including storytelling. So um, I got to know uh, Alice and Elizabeth largely through Dungeons and Dragons, um, and I got to know Eli um, Alice especially through Elizabeth. And Alice is in charge of, among the many things she does at the library, a, a streaming series called The Role of Play, which... Um, uses works of literature, artworks, um, as the basis for various kinds of board games, including tabletop role-playing games, and live streams them through the library website. And I, you know, now like getting into Dungeons and Dragons, um, I was running games for people. Um, I thought, wouldn't it be fun, because I research opera, um, that's largely what I, I think and write about, I thought, what if we could use an opera as the basis for um, a D&D adventure campaign thing. And uh, Alice was kind enough to let me do this. And so we ran it and live streamed it. You can still see it on the uh, Role of Play uh, Twitch channel. Um, and it was a lot of fun. And as I worked through this, I realized that doing this made me question a lot of the issues within the operas to do with things like how do characters develop? How do social categories work, like gender or class? You know, how do the characters interact you know, in these ways? And how do I, as someone telling this story, try and develop these characters so that they are real for the players and not just kind of you know, a side character that happens to be there? And one thing about opera is that it is a, not the best at treating women like fully human beings. Um, <laughs> Ariane knows. Um, <laughs> It is a pretty misogynist art form, and often women are treated as kind of objects for a plot to happen or have to be disposed of at the end in order for resolution to occur, or generally just don't have agency. And so I realized in the course of running the Rusalka game that I had not actually fixed any of that. All I had done was give the players an entry into the story and told them, hey, fix this problem. Rusalka's father is the one that gives them the quest to go fix things. Um, whereas Rusalka remains a kind of semi-passive character, although they could have fought her at the end, which is some sort of agency, I suppose. But ultimately, I didn't fix any problems. So I realized one thing I could try and do with these stories once I started writing more of them was to 
get at some of these problems, these things that are inherent to opera that you can't write out, you can't get rid of them, but you can try and retell the story in a way to foreground the complexity of these things. I think opera is a really amazing and valuable art form. I think there's things that are incredibly beautiful about it, that it can be a very powerful way of storytelling, um, in part because of the music. But there are things that, you know, we have to deal with as well, like the inherent misogyny of the genre. So the next one I wrote um, was one based on an opera from 1625 by the composer Francesca Caccini called The Liberation of Ruggiero from the Island of Alcina. Um, and this is where I really started to grapple with this idea of how can these adventures be arts research? How can I use telling this story collaboratively as a way to get into this story, to get into these characters and really try to understand what's happening? Uh, and we have a video example of when we live streamed this one through Roll of Play, um, where that um, became evident. Uh, because the players were running around this island trying to figure out what to do about the evil sorceress Alcina, who has imprisoned the knight Ruggiero, and generally just been causing trouble for surrounding uh, kingdoms. Um, the good sorceress Melissa accompanied them to the island. They also found another person there named Atalante, who was also helping them out. I was not a fan. You were not a fan. Um, My character just decided she hated him. <laughs> but eventually I thought, oh, they'll interact with these you know, powerful sorcerer characters and kind of, you know, I'll be able to, those people will have ideas about what to do about the evil sorceress. Um, but then they did something I wasn't expecting, which is there's another character, uh, Alcina, as part of her evil deeds, has transformed a whole bunch of people into plants. Her former lovers now a grove of plants on the island that sing in this beautiful um, chorus in the opera proper. Uh, and so they went to the leader of the plants, a former lover of Alcina, and asked this person, who I had done no thinking about, um, what, th what they should do about Alcina. And so this is what happened. Stolfo, just trying, is the plant with Stolfo hanging out? Yeah. Hey, what do you think we should do to Alcina? What do you think we should do? Hmm, what would he say? Melissa thinks we should save her. This other dude thinks we should kill her. I don't know. What do you think? You're the one who's a plant. Because of her. Because of her. It's her fault. Your plant. How's being plant? And he lied, like other plants. Why did you question the random NPC with a deep moral and ethical <laughs> dilemma? The random NPC about whom I have done very little thinking is a plant. Um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> because we're us. Yeah, of course, yeah. Okay, I, I, I do need to think about this for a it's second. Play um, testing. It's this is play testing. This is play testing for really content know, that will actually. come out in a book <laughs> that Chris is working on. So. So yeah, so this really forced me to kind of think about some of these stories on a much deeper level. Um, actually, I'll go back to that slide in a second. Um, and so what ended up happening is that I realized that, you know, it could be a really interesting project to try and develop a book of these adventures that I could put out in the world that enable people to play through the stories of these operas and really engage with these, these ideas. Um, and so I'm working on a book right now of these various stories. Um, which will hopefully be published with, under the title of Adventures in Arias, an operatic source for D&D 5th edition. Um, and this has led to other kinds of things in the meantime. So this poster, um, you don't need to worry about the text, but basically we presented this at the American Musicological Society um, back in November of last year, um, just as a way of you know, showcasing how this was working in, kind of the, in the larger process of telling these stories, trying to make uh, these stories more inclusive, allowing people to tell their own stories within these frameworks. So, um, oh, we got that. That's okay. Right. Yeah, so part of what we're realizing is that if we want to make something more accessible, if we want everyone to play together, and we believe in this as a mode of creating, building, sustaining community, we can't think about access just in terms of disability, right? You can't dismantle ableism without also trying to tackle every other form of oppression. Like these are all interlocking and interdependent. So it's like these two things were happening at once and then we realize that actually it's one huge project where everything should help kind of every other component of it. Um, at the same time, Alice and I had, I think by, by this point we had kind of wrapped up that first grant and we were preparing to play test and we'd been operating under the assumption that a lot of people have made accessible character sheets. And there's all these videos on YouTube explaining how to play D&D. Um, yes, but none of them were working 
for, for what we needed. So we kind of paused, went and asked ICAT for money. Thank you, ICAT, for a mini seed grant. Uh, so we could create the character sheets. Um, we're also working on cards for abilities that aren't spells and making like a, a video series where everything is short to the point, explains the concept, demonstrates it, and, and you can kind of move on. At the same time, we've been building a much larger network. So we have partners now um, at Cleveland Institute of Music, uh, Caitlin Martinkus and Scott Hannenberg, uh, at the Berkeley College of Music, uh, which is Jay Edelstein, who's their neurodiverse program manager. Uh, University of Texas at Austin, we're working with Andrew Del Antonio, and at California State University San Bernardino, we're working with Jessica Getman. We keep like building our network out so that we'll be able to get the tools in a lot of people's hands. So let me just show you a, a bit of a visual. You don't necessarily need to read all of this text. Yeah, my eyes are not good enough for this nonsense. I'm going to get closer. Um, so these are spell cards that would be released by Hasbro, which is the parent company of Wizards of the Coast, which then owns Dungeons and Dragons. This is one spell called Find Familiar, and the gist of the spell is it lets you have a little animal friend. <laughs> but this is what it looks like. Now picture, these are what, baseball card sized? Yeah, yeah they're, they're little, maybe even smaller when you print them off. There are like online versions. You need two of them just for the text of one spell. The coloring around it, too, is also any spell that a wizard uses will all be the same color. Any spell that a bard uses will all be the same color. Our version um, tries to capture the main points of the spell in more accessible language and present that information in a standardized order and position. The idea is the person running the game, which the dungeon master, the game manager, however you want to call it, that person can look up all the nitty gritty details if they need it. I mean, we all have cell phones in our pockets most of the time. What do you actually need when you're playing? And we were able to make that massive monster thing into one card. We also made sure that the color means something uh, because if everything in your hand is the same color, color becomes a useless feature. So now the color will tell you if it's a cantrip, first, second level spell, if something that is important to know at the game, how much you can cast and when. Uh, similarly, this is uh, an image of the character sheet that would be produced by Hasbro, Wizards of the Coast, Dungeons and Dragons. This is three pages of it. Many of them are eight pages long, very, very small font, versus our character sheets, which are two pages. Uh, they're color-coded to match our decision guide, which I'll show you in a moment. So the side that you're going to use most um, if you're fighting a dragon <laughs> is going to be this like pink and red side. And if you're exploring a dungeon, it would be the blue and, and green side. You get the information that you actually need for playing the character versus what you need to play the character, but also what you need to level up the character versus pages of stuff that you don't actually need, but some other person at your table might. Again, like keeping it straightforward, manageable, and, and legible. And this pairs nicely with our decision guide. Because when, when Chris is DMing us, uh, oftentimes you describe the world that you've created and then you end up saying, what do you want to do? Because you can try to do anything in Dungeons and Dragons, anything. You may um, fail or succeed based on how the dice roll and you know, that sort of thing, but you can try to do anything and that by itself can be a huge obstacle. It's both the benefit of this art form and something that makes it challenging. Um, because if you suffer from decision paralysis or decision fatigue, I mean, this goes for not just folks with anxiety or autistic people like me, but also parents. Like, we've worked with a lot of moms who spend all of their brain power organizing the family schedule and planning meals. They do not need their downtime to be stressful, right? So instead of telling, like, having it very mechanics heavy, it's supporting both kind of decision-making and memory, but thinking of it in a, in a storytelling mode. So it's not like, you can roll this particular stat. It's, have you asked what something looks like or smells like? Keeps you in, in that world. Right, so the next tool we have is a character creator. I think in the interest of time uh, and getting to questions, I'm just gonna describe it quickly. Effectively, this is a mode of storytelling that helps people who have never played before get into the game and come up with a class. So do you wanna be a wizard? Do you wanna be a a uh, paladin, do you want to be a fighter? These are kind of, can be very overwhelming sets of mechanics for people that have never encountered this stuff before or, you know, have various kinds of cognitive um, issues. And so by just basically saying like, here's a story, here's a, a scene, like this person that you have in your mind, what do they want to do here? 
Um, so we told a little story together. We did a presentation for um, Humanities Week last semester. Um, and yeah, actually, I'll maybe just play this. It's short. Um, Victor, faced with this choice of fighting versus running, um, what would they prefer to do? Oh, I'm going to stay and fight. Yeah. OK. He seems decisive. I'll go with him. <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious, you know, what, based on what you think of your character, how would they want to fight um, when faced with, you know, whoever's about to come through that door? Um, would you try and be sneaky? Would you try and confront them head on? Would you maybe cast a spell? Can I have the, can I have the tarps? Yeah. Okay. I love that. I yeah. want, yeah. Some random tarps. But you can also space. just use your fists if you wanted to. Since oh, we're yeah. in the temple, can I be in a kneeling position praying? Yes. As my attack. Uh huh. You absolutely can do that. Okay. So. Oh, I love that. Oh. <laughs> uh, at this point, basically, they had been playing for 20 minutes. And I had basically said, hey, how, here's the setup. You're in a temple. Some people are about to come and fight you. What do you want to do? And seeing people get into it and suggest things that I even had no idea they were going to do. Like, uh, one of them wanted to steal a bunch of tarps that had been hiding some weapons. One of them wanted to kneel down and pray to potentially try and fool people. And these were ideas that I had no idea they were going to do. But they were already in it, already telling a story, already starting to think about what is this character, who are they, what are they doing. So that was, I think, a nice way into it. So all of this together, all of these things that we've come up with are now kind of under this larger umbrella of Open the Gates, um, our, the name of our research collective, which in part references, a, you know, in every fantasy movie ever, they're like, open the gates, someone's coming in or whatever. So, but. Uh, oh yeah, but it's also mentioning the gatekeeping that has been a reality of tabletop role playing games and Dungeons and Dragons. Um, every single person on our team has an identity that could have been a reason that we never even got into this game. We managed to sneak in, so now we're trying to open the gates from the inside and let more folks in. So our logo, which our beautiful graphic designers have finished for us very recently, you're kind of looking from inside the fortress out as that big portcullis and everything opens and into a world of adventure. Um, we have articulated over the course of the last year or so what our core values are that everyone's a storyteller and play is a human right. Uh, we also believe that systems have to be flexible to be accessible. And we wanna challenge the idea that there's just one hero's journey. That one hero's journey, journey is usually about able-bodied, that's how white men. But yep. like we want as many different takes on this and stories, right? People to see themselves as the hero. And I think one of the most important parts is that we look to those most impacted for leadership. We're not gonna design for people, we're gonna support them and design with them. Do you wanna do a? Yeah, so, and this is our mission statement. I'll just read it briefly and I think we can wrap it up. Yep. With this, so play is a human right and open the gates. Gaming empowers everyone to tell their story through the medium of tabletop role playing games. We develop open access tools so everyone can play together without altering the rules of the game, adding flexibility to make systems like Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition more accessible. The adventures we write represent creative arts-based research on opera that does not merely witness or reenact one author's story, but instead allows players to inhabit the operas, wrestle with exclusionary narratives, and craft their own hero's journey. If we can do one more slide, because I think yeah. this will be nice for, yeah. if, if you're interested in being involved, what comes next? So um, right now, we're still finishing designing the tools and all of that. But in August, we're going to work with the Disability Community Technology Center, which is uh, funded by a generous grant from the Mellon Foundation, um, and Ashley Shue's branch of it, which is Disability Forward Research Consulting. We're going to work with them in August so we can have more experts, more people with disabilities try out our tools. In October, we're going to do wide-scale play testing. If you're interested in hosting one of these events, we would bring the DMs, the materials, everything to you, and folks can try it out and tell us what they think, and then we can make changes to the design. Our plan is to release our tools, open access, free to everyone by the end of the year, hopefully by December. Um, next year, we're gonna look towards establishing a pattern of doing a local event every semester, but we also have a lot of partners that are interested in hosting us on a tour where we would have a performance, which is uh, a little bit like the Twitch stream you saw, but it's done live, like we'd be on a stage playing oftentimes with a couple people from that area too. Um, 
showing off the tools and what they can do, and then we'll do workshops to support folks and let them play. We'll run games. And through all of this, it'll be about listening to what our communities need next. But yeah, we'd love to uh, have see. any questions. Oh yeah, as a reminder, you can join us and try playing uh, this afternoon at 3 p.m. And we have some of those flyers over here if you wanna take them with you. But yeah, we'd love any questions, comments, thoughts that y'all have. <laughs> that was not me. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Um, I, I love this combination of gaming and music and opera and creative storytelling, and, and it's so iCat. I love it. What, uh, what questions do we have? If you're interested in uh, helping the project in uh, various ways, other than uh, this afternoon, what other opportunities are there down the line? Be in touch with me. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're hoping to do in October, we would love to have 100 different people play test our tools. And we're, the model we've kind of laid out is if we can find five organizations to host, we can bring four or five DMs and run games for like 20 people at a time. So this is definitely something. Um, we're always looking for folks that are interested in playing on live streams. So really, um, I think my email is on this flyer under accessibility stuff, but if you wanna reach out there, that would be best. We're also on social media. Um, we're just really starting that. <laughs> so it looks a little bare bones, but it's Open the Gates Gaming on Facebook and Instagram. But if you're in touch with us, we can then try to figure out more, more things to do. Because we'd like to host more local games especially once we feel like the tools and adventures are like ready to go that we can just hand them off to folks. Any other stuff that y'all are thinking of? Um, no, I'll say like with the live streaming, like this has been a really useful way of, of play testing some of the things that I've been writing down and just kind of, and also for our tools. So like, you know, it's, it's informal. It's not like, you know, a big, uh, I don't know, a scary thing, I suppose. So, yeah. So yeah, but it, it you know I, I really enjoy playing with lots of different people and because everybody's got a different take and everybody's got a different way of engaging with this stuff, which I think is really valuable when you're trying to develop a story that can be as inclusive as possible, right? So we can also come to your classes with enough notice. So um, we didn't mention this, but we've done uh, gaming labs for disability culture in the arts, and soon you're gonna be coming to my music and disability class because we're gonna talk about opera and madness by letting students actually play through the opera and have to confront these very like two-dimensional female characters and, uh, and, and deal with those stereotypes. It'll, the, they will learn in a much different and more visceral way what the problem is, <laughs> I think, and how to, how to deal with it. So that's another thing, like if you have events, if you're interested, we, we would love to partner as we have resources, of course. But, yeah. Can you all talk about how your disciplines have informed this work, your academic disciplines? Sure. It's very strange, it's a bunch of music people. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, well, so obviously, you know, I'm a musicologist by training music historian, so I, you know, I, I know these stories of operas very deeply, um, and I teach them a lot too, so, so that's where a lot of this came from. Um, you know, one thing that's interesting about this is that, especially with, with events like this or live streams, things like that, you can't actually play music unless it's copyright free, so that's a whole thing. But you know, part of the thing about opera is that the music is part of the, the storytelling, so it makes opera unique. And so when I've done these games for like not on camera, <laughs> um, you know, I'll play music and have this kind of stuff going as well as a way to kind of, another way to get into it. Um, but yeah. I mean, and there's a very disability studies angle to all of this work because here at Virginia Tech, we're in the process of continuing to grow the disability studies minor. It's the largest pathways minor at the university, but we're continuing to build and especially center disabled voices and make sure that it has that, that liberatory approach that um, other identity studies programs like women and gender studies and Africana studies have. So this has been a really fascinating way to let people get in the inside of it and also get at what it actually means to let disabled folks design their own things, tell their own stories. So there's, there's that kind of angle I'll also speak to the fact that we have a couple music theorists who are part of our team. Uh, one of them, Caitlin Martinkus, she brings a lot of expertise in pedagogy that's helped communicate information very clearly. Um, we have nicknames uh, based in D&D &D nerd dumb for each other and we joke that she's the face because she's got a lot of charisma. She's like kind of heading up the video part of it and, and getting how to teach and communicate information. 
Um, Scott Hannenberg, the music theorist, he loves spreadsheets and rules, and that has been really helpful. We call him the rules lawyer. So even though it doesn't seem like, oh yeah, you need a music theorist to make sure that this is compatible, it, it really, like the training does kind of support it. And Alice, I'm gonna let you speak for yourself because you do too many things for me to even summarize. I, I do, I kick you. Um, and because my vocation is in you know, the library, but specifically in making technology accessible to people, um, I manage the technology lending desk. And so a lot of that is not just giving people the item, but figuring out ways to make sure they understand how to use the item. And uh, a lot of that vocational work, and also I'm working on my MLIS, um, working in sort of this literacy of objects and not just language, um, definitely comes into play here. So that's, that's sort of how I'm utilizing that in this project. Thank you so much. We are at time. I hope you will continue the conversations and enjoy more donuts. We will be back next week with The Beat Goes On, uh, continuing our theme for the, the semester. Um, look forward. Thank you all so much. Everybody have a great Friday and a great weekend.